I'm not going to repeat anything that I previously put on a video because uh, I don't want to do that to my live audience, have them listen to this twice. But we lost a, maybe 10 minutes of our video. Um, this is the 8th of November and uh, we're finishing up the first chapter of Hebrews going into the second. If in fact it was as those people who lived in the first, second, third, fourth centuries believed that it was the Apostle Paul, these Hebrews who were discouraged, they were Christians, they had accepted Christ as Savior, but they were still practicing the law and they were discouraged and like they were after they were brought out of Egypt and kept saying we should have gone back to Egypt. Yeah, where they were slaves, where they suffered, all of that. But you know, when you're discouraged, when you're down, you don't always make real good sense. So those are three of the possible writers and I believe that the reason they didn't say who it was, was that they would not have been taken seriously for one reason or another. And that's the reason it was written, was to encourage them to continue serving Jesus. And that's why every time you turn around, you read in the book of Hebrews, Jesus is greater than the angels. Jesus is greater than Moses. Jesus is greater than Joshua. Jesus is greater than David. Uh, later we're going to get Jesus was uh, uh, out of the order of Melchizedek, which I'll explain to you, if not tonight, next Sunday night. All right. The last um, little bit... Uh, in the first chapter of Hebrews says in verses 13 and 14 about the angels. Now to which of the angels has he said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool? No angel was given the privilege to sit next to the throne of God the Father in heaven. Therefore, since Jesus sits at a throne to the right hand of God the Father in heaven that makes him higher than the angels. Possibly because we just studied this when I was praying this morning for the children that were beheaded about probably 12 hours ago now in Iraq. I was reminded of Stephen. S Stephen was one of the first deacons, as was uh, Philip. And Stephen was stoned to death. And since we just read this last Sunday, it was on my mind. that angels are ministering spirits sent out to those who are going to inherit salvation but God the Father said to Jesus sit at my right hand when the religious fanatics stoned Philip to death it came to me this morning when I was praying for those children on another video that Stephen, as he was dying, being killed for his faith like these Christians, and it's Franklin Graham's, Billy Graham's son, uh, who wrote the... Uh, email that I included in the video this morning. 
and the UN has pulled out and uh, their group that has been sneaking food in to the last remaining Christians are there and, and they were only 10 minutes when that was written probably about 12 hours ago uh, or maybe a little bit more but it reminded me of his dying for his faith and our brothers and sisters in, in Jesus um, well I care about everybody there's a question uh, for those of you on the video don't know but uh, we have a chat box and um, I really care about everybody especially Christians who are dying for their faith. I answer questions at the end of the teaching, so if you want to hang around till then, we can discuss it if you like. But it reminded me that when Philip was dying for his faith, he looked up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God the Father not in his normal position of sitting and that made me think of this song so over the week since last Sunday I looked it up and, and found the words and was able to make the music for it alright now we go to chapter 2 we must therefore pay even more attention to what we've heard. So that we will not drift away. For it is the message spoken through the angels was legally binding. And every transgression and disobedience received a just punishment. We're going to talk either tonight or next uh, Sunday night about crime and punishment in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Everything in the Old Testament pointed toward the New. It talked about the sin. It talked about the price that would have to be paid because the sins were committed. And Jesus fulfilled every part of that Jesus was the sacrifice he was the lamb whose blood was slain for our sin he was also the high priest who conducted the ceremony every detail of redemption in the Old Testament is fulfilled by Jesus in the new he says if the message was spoken through angels if, if that was legally binding and if every sin or disobedience got a just punishment not too much not too little but the correct punishment for a particular sin if that's true if it's true and this is a, a scripture that I think most of us at a very young age memorized in the King James Bible how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation God's plan 
for us to be forgiven was so great and so fair that if we don't receive salvation through Jesus' blood, what other chance is there for us? God took his own son and made him the sacrificial lamb. If we throw that in God's face, what hope do we have for any other plan of salvation? How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It was first spoken by the Lord and it was confirmed to us by those who heard him. At the same time, God also testified by signs and wonders and various miracles and the distributions or the gifts from the Holy Spirit according to his will. We have one more, I think, I'm pretty sure, one more lesson next Sunday on the gifts of the Holy Spirit before we finish that series of about four lessons. It was first spoken by the Lord and it was confirmed to those who heard it. And God just didn't speak it and do nothing else and leave it up to the people. He encouraged them by doing signs and wonders and various miracles and distributions of gifts of the Holy Spirit that we just happened to be studying on Sunday morning according to his will. Now we go into, that's, we've discussed Jesus and the angels now. Now we're going into Jesus and humanity. Verse 5. For he has not subjected to angels the world to come that we're talking about. But one has somewhere testified. The angels are not subject to the same rules and regulations as us. Angels are different from us. Angels don't die. They don't get old. They don't get married. They don't get replaced. You hear the story, and I don't know where it started, but that's all it is is a story. That when little babies die, they become angels. They don't. That's like saying when little kitties die, they become Great Danes, it, it, a different species. Um, angels don't have a sin problem. We do because of Adam. It's called original sin. Angels have never had that. So you can't compare people to angels. What is man? This is another verse that's memorized by so many Christians. What is man that you remember him or the son of man that you care for him? Speaking of God, you made him, that's man, God made man lower than the angels. The angels were created first. They were created to be servants of God. Many of them are messengers. Many of them are assigned to look after us. And you see pictures of young children going over a bridge and the angels are nearby 
making sure that they don't misstep and fall off the bridge. Man was created to have fellowship with God. That's why we were made in his image. We know a little bit about what God's character is like because we know what we're like. And God said to his son, let us make man in our image. We can get our feelings hurt. You all could hurt my feelings if you, well, I don't get my feelings hurt very easy. But we can get our feelings hurt, and God's feelings have been hurt. When he prepared them a time and place to cross over into the promised land, and they didn't trust him and said, no, we think the people are too big and they'll kill us off. God, we don't think you can protect us. God's feelings were hurt. We know something about the nature of God because we understand ourselves and we're made in his image. We can love and we can be loved. We can hate and we can be hated. We're made in his image. In subjecting everything to him. Um, John 1.1 1, 1, In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. Meaning God the Father and Jesus the Son of God. Uh, also God spoke things into existence. For in subjecting everything to him, he left nothing that's not subject to him. The weather is subject to him. Animals are subject to him. Even kings. That's why it's so hard to pray for things that happen during wars and so forth because we know that at any time God could step in and change things. He has an overall plan and he's not likely to change anything that would affect his overall plan. And that's why when we see children sick and dying or being killed uh, and we see people suffer it hurts us. Everything is subject to him. That's why we pray. But we do see Jesus made a little lower than the angels for a short time. He's above the angels. As a matter of fact, he created the angels. But for that time, a period of time, that he took our sins upon him, during that period of time, he was lower than the angels. So that by God's grace, he could taste death for everybody. If an angel would have died on the cross, you and I couldn't be saved. He was crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. Verse 10, and these are very short chapters. It was fitting in bringing many sons to glory many Christians getting saved that he, Jesus for whom and through whom all things exist reminding us again of John 1.1 1, 1, 
Jesus is co-creator of everything. He existed before creation. We, he has no beginning. He has no end. I remember teaching a little geometry to one of my sixth grade classes. A line, uh, let's see if there's something I could write on. In geometry, well, let me show you a ray first, because then I can do it all with one picture. A ray looks like that, like an arrow. It points in one direction. On the side that has the arrow in geometry, that means it goes on and on and on and on and on forever in that direction, future. That is mankind. There is a point at which we're born, and once we're born, we then live eternally. Here, heaven, hell, wherever. Once we're born, we then have eternal life. A line looks like this. As far as future, it goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. But as far as beginning, it goes forever and ever and ever and ever. And because the earth is circular, I, was t I remember, it's just one of those things that just hit me uh, suddenly while I was teaching. It happens sometimes when I'm preaching. I remember telling my class that because the world is round, that thing could go out of our classroom into another classroom and go over and come back over here and wind up in the exact same spot. That is God. No beginning and no end. We have a beginning and no end. God has no beginning and no end. He always has been. He always will be. That makes him different from the angels. And I've already mentioned the differences between us and the angels. Um... It was fitting that by bringing many sons to glory that he, for whom and through whom all things exist. John 1.1 1, 1. If something exists that was made by Jesus, the very fact that something is, is proof of Jesus. And the Creator is greater than the creation. The person who composes or writes a song is greater than a particular song that he writes because he can go on and write many, many, many. The creator is always above his or her creation. Should make the source of their salvation perfect through suffering. 
Our salvation exists because Jesus suffered. For the one who sanctifies Okay, do we remember what sanctifies and sanctification and holiness is? It means two things. One, that it is holy or becoming holy or, and pure. The other, that it's been set aside for a particular service. So when we buy a new organ or a new piano for the church, we dedicate it for the work of God to be played in that church. We can't make a piano perfect, but we can promise to use it for a specific purpose. So the one who sanctifies The one who makes someone else holy. That would be God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The one who sanctifies. And those that are sanctified have one Father. So we're the ones who are set aside for a particular purpose to serve God. And God is the one who sets us aside. So we are one with Christ. And as the Bible says in another place, we're joint heirs with Christ. He's God's son. And we're children of God. So as the children inherit from their parent, Jesus inherits, but we co-inherit with him. That's why Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brothers. I'm going to go back and read that. For the one who sanctifies and those that are sanctified have one father. That's why he's not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, and this is what Jesus says, Speaking to his father, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. Jesus is telling God the Father, I will tell your other sons and daughters, the ones that are saved, I will proclaim your name to my brothers. I will sing hymns to you in the congregation. Jesus is promising to worship his Father. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. Now we've got four more verses in this chapter. Again, I will trust in him. And again, here I am with the children God gave me. These are the words of Jesus. Now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, he also shares in these so that through his death he may destroy the one holding power over death. That is the devil. 
So when Jesus died on the cross, he died to forgive us our sins or to make it possible so that we could have our sins forgiven. But at the same time, he destroyed Satan. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, Satan tempted Eve, and she was dumb. She believed him. Satan said to Eve, Oh, did he tell you uh, not to eat a certain fruit from a certain tree? Because if you did, you would be wise. You would know everything God knows. You would just be real smart. But that's not true. You'll know things that you don't know now if you eat this fruit. And Eve believed him. Now, when Eve ate the fruit, and she went and she talked to Adam, Adam knew better. He knew what was going on, just like when this guy called me today. I knew what was going on. And I had to do some things to protect myself. These people were going to show up with $5 million and a brand new Lexus for me. Can you imagine that? Uh, they were going to be on my doorstep. Uh, I knew better. I know there's people my age that can't find the start button on a computer. But I happen to be one of the older people that pretty hard to fool. And Adam knew better. This scam, and it's it's out of um, oh, what's the name of the place? Uh, Jamaica. I know because I double checked the area code. <laughs> um, in most scams, they'll say, "Well, we're going to give you five million dollars, but but we need a thousand dollars in taxes. So we're going to give you five million. Just give us a thousand. Like." Do I look like I, <laughs> I would fall for that? Um, Adam knew better. So, God punished Adam and Eve and Satan. Adam and Eve would not live forever. Had they not sinned, you and I would be in the Garden of Eden and we'd be eating like vegetarians or vegans. But Adam's punishment was, you're not going to sit under a cherry tree and do nothing but play with Eve. You're going to work, and you're going to get tired, and your muscles are going to hurt, and your back's going to go out. To Eve, he said, you're going to be subject to Adam. He's going to be over you. He'll tell you what to do, and you'll say, yes, dear. And you're going to have babies, and it's going to hurt when you do. And you won't live forever. You will die.
But the serpent, the devil, also got a punishment. God said to Satan, you will bruise the heel of the Son of God. But he will bruise your head. This takes place in the first four chapters in the book of Genesis. A bruise on the heel, a burn, a sore, a rash, a cut. It's, it's a hassle. It bugs you. It's not pleasant, but it doesn't kill you. The Son of God to you will bruise your head. In the Garden of Eden, Satan bruised the head, I'm sorry, the heel. An inconvenience, a dis-ease means not to feel at ease. That's what dis-ease, disease is. But on Calvary, the Son of God bruised the head, gave a fatal wound. Let me read that verse again now that I've explained it. Encourage each other daily. Whoops, wrong column. Um, now, since the children have flesh and blood in common, he also shared in those so that through his death he might destroy the one holding the power of death. Because Jesus died, he destroyed the power that Satan had over us. And if we trust in him, we can be victorious over physical death and we would have been over physical death. We do die. But we don't have to die spiritually. That none of you is hardened by sin's dis... Eh, wrong column. Uh, that he might destroy the one holding the power of death, that is the devil. Uh, got a couple more verses to go. And free those who were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. We don't have to fear death anymore. I admire those who are faced with suffering or death for their faith. Some people would say, well, I'll lie. I'll say, sure, I'll convert because it's die, be beheaded, or convert. And some will say, in my heart, I'll love God. But with my mouth, I'll tell that fool, yeah, I'm a Muslim. He said, and free those that were held in slavery all their lives by the fear of death. The Apostle Paul said, whether I live or whether I die, if, if I die, I die in Christ. If I live, I live in Christ. 
Paul, because he was getting old and, and he had uh, some physical illnesses and he was getting old, he said, I'd love to go to heaven. It's better for me if I die and go to heaven. But it's better for you if I stay here and keep teaching you. For it's clear. I want to check the time. For it's clear that he does not reach out to help angels. Of course, angels don't die. but to help Abraham's offspring. And we have so many commonalities between our Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night services that I keep finding things that are similar. That God doesn't reach out to help angels, but he reaches out to help Abraham's offspring. And I mentioned this morning who Abraham's, well, maybe I mentioned it in the video I made. I don't know. It's been a long day. I've been up since three. But God does reach out to help Abraham's offspring. And who is Abraham's offspring? We all are. The Jews are offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The Arabs, the Egyptians, the, those from Libya, those from Arabia, those from the Mideast, they are Abraham's descendants. Why? Because before Isaac was born, Abraham's wife Sarah said, I'm pretty old and have no children so why don't you um, go into my maid the children will be mine legally because she was as a product of slavery in those days she was Sarah's property so it's just like when my birds have babies they're mine. There's a pet store down the mountain that pays me because my birds come with flight training and then their wings are clipped and they're healthy. They can be in cages. They can be out of cages. Uh, and so no problem. They pay me $55 for every little bird. Of course, <laughs> I spend so much keeping them healthy that I really don't make any money. I would just assume they didn't have babies and I didn't have to go through this. We'll, we'll have at least one by Wednesday. It was a week, three weeks ago this morning that the um, stand was behind me and she flew from the stand into her cage and laid an egg. And after I turned the computers off and went to check, I found the egg. So that was three weeks ago today, 21 days. She started incubating the next day, which means that tomorrow the oldest egg will have been sat on for 21 days so it could be tomorrow it could be the next day it could be Wednesday pretty sure that by Wednesday uh, we'll have at least one or we we'll at least find out maybe that the egg wasn't any good but that's what we have to look forward to now we are all Abraham's children. The Jews, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
the Arab population in the Mideast, sons of Abraham, through Abraham Hagar, who was Egyptian. So they are Abraham's children. And we, what have we got to do with it? Well, we are Abraham's children because our salvation comes through faith. And who is the father of all faith? The one that when God says, okay, Abraham, Take your son, you know, this one that's going to give you so many kids, as many as the sands of the sea or the stars in the sky. I want you to take him up and he's going to be the sacrifice. You lay him on the altar. You take a knife to him. You light the wood underneath him and you burn that sacrifice. And Abraham said, okay. And before they climbed Mount Moriah, which, by the way, happens to be Mount Zion, the mount where the temple and the al Mosque is, before he went up there, he said to his people, the lad and I will go on. You all stay here. We will return. Now, you can't have it both ways. You can't take your son's life and sacrifice it and then return with him. But Abraham says, okay. Not only did he tell God, okay, but he told people, the lad and I will return. How can you take a knife to somebody and say, uh, we'll be back shortly. The book of Hebrews tells us the answer was Abraham believed in the resurrection. We don't have the resurrection of Jesus yet. We don't have Lazarus being raised from the dead. Where did Abraham get this idea of the resurrection? He believed God. He believed God could do anything. For it's clear that he does not reach out to help angels but he did to help Abraham's offspring, which is the Jews, the Mid-Easterners, and the rest of the world else. Therefore, and we're almost through for this evening, therefore, he had to be like his brothers in every way so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus had to become like us so that he could be a high priest. Now, Jesus is already the sacrifice. He's the animal that people brought to the temple when they sinned. And the priest would lay hands on the animal, thereby transferring the sin of the person who brings the animal to the animal. And the animal dies in place of the person. So by dying on the cross, Jesus becomes the sacrifice. But hey, it goes beyond that. And we're still in the second chapter. 
he goes beyond being the sacrifice he is also the high priest who accepts the offering and makes propitiation he does the priestly duties so he does all of this he bruises the head of Satan who could had the power of giving you and I eternal death on the cross Jesus takes care of him on the cross Jesus becomes the sacrifice the animal that bleeds so that our sins get forgiven but now Jesus becomes the high priest who oversees this matter of sacrifice therefore he's like his brothers in every way so that he could become merciful and faithful high priest in service to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people last verse for since he himself was tested and suffered He is able to help those who are tested. I'm looking for what I want to use as a bookmark. Jesus is able to help you and I when we're tempted. Don't say, well, I'm tempted. I can't do anything about it. This is a great big temptation. You don't know how bad I'm tempted, how bad I feel. Oh, yeah, he does. Satan took him on top of the temple and said, jump down and I'll do such and such for you. Satan's going to do Jesus a favor? I don't think so. The verse ends by saying, since he himself was tested and he suffered. You can't say, well, God doesn't understand how bad it hurts. He is able to help those who are tested. There's nothing you go through that he hasn't experienced. So we're going to end. We just got one chapter in today. Um, in chapter 3, he becomes our apostle and our high priest. So he is the sacrifice. He is the priest who performs the service. And now he is the apostle that God has chosen to be the teacher, the spiritual teacher of the people. Give me just a moment to turn off our video and I'll be right back with our life group. Until the next video, blessings on you.